Thank you so much, David. I'm honored to be standing next to you, and thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me. And uh, I'm especially honored to have uh, shared the stage with Jerry. <laughs> uh, I have to say, if this is a great debate, uh, he's Lincoln and I'm Douglas. Uh, so, uh, but um, I just, you know, I, I, I will talk a little bit about some of the options for patients uh, apart from transplant, but I, I'll be honest, I, I don't know if I disagree with Jerry's last comment about this particular patient. But I think over the course of the next few years, there's going to be some options that may change the paradigm of how we approach patients uh, who have highly resistant CML and seem to be progressing on uh, standard of treatment. Uh, so this is a, an image that's probably commonly seen and borrowed from the government website, which uh, demonstrates the Philadelphia chromosome, which most of the folks in this room are familiar with, the uh, canonical translocation uh, leading to the Philadelphia chromosome, the fusion uh, protein uh, BCR ABL, which leads to um, a constitutive uh, activation and activity of uh, the ABL kinase uh, and the underlying uh, uh, pathophysiology of the disease. Uh, this is the uh, ABL1 kinase, uh, the target of the various uh, small molecule agents that seek to inhibit it and provide therapeutic impact. Uh, the orange uh, complex you see right in the uh, ATP binding uh, socket there, that's, the, uh, that's a matnib. Uh, most of the other uh, TKIs, whether it's the satnib, nilotinib, basutinib, panatinib, also occupy that pocket in various different ways. We're going to talk about uh, another uh, class of drugs um, and one drug that's coming uh, through the uh, development uh, fairly, in, a, in fairly promising fashion that binds a separate region uh, of the ABL kinase and may have a therapeutic uh, impact. So uh, I would also like to start by uh, providing uh, a, a slide on the IRIS trial, the famous IRIS trial that first led uh, to the approval and availability of imatinib, uh, the first impressive TKI for um, chronic myeloid leukemia, and showed a marked advantage in comparison uh, with um, interferon and low-dose cytarabine for patients with this disease. Um, as you can see, the progression-free survival updated through the years has continued to show an advantage to imatinib over time, where patients are now having long-term survivals uh, approaching 90% uh, and higher. Um, but one of the things that we oftentimes uh, allude to is very early on we got a sense that there is a resistance pattern, a primary and secondary resistance pattern that evolves uh, following initiation of uh, TKI treatment. And this was seen within the first two or three years uh, of treatment uh, with imatinib and also with the other TKIs where patients start to lose response and over time you can actually find um, able kinase domain mutations that render that resistance. And actually this, I believe uh, Jerry just showed this very same uh, plot uh, demonstrating that individuals who have kinase domain mutations actually have overall um, a worsening of their uh, PFS over time, uh, which is uh, uh, obviously an area which requires uh, further uh, study and uh, drug development. Um, this is another picture of the uh, ABL kinase demonstrating multiple different uh, resistance mutations. Uh, there are others, uh, but uh, prominent ones are shown here with perhaps the most prominent and concerning one being T315I right in the middle there or upper middle, um, being resistant to a vast majority of um, uh, targeted therapies uh, for uh, CML. And as can be seen here, T315I mutations um, lead to worsened uh, survival uh, in patients. Uh, various studies have demonstrated this. Um, it, sort of to hammer home the point in a different fashion, you can see the variety of different ABL kinase domain mutations listed here. Um, they, uh, you can choose a sort of a traditional TKI to target them uh, for the vast majority, but for T315I, whether it's a matnib, nilotinib, desatnib, basutinib, they're resistant. Uh, ponatinib, uh, having uh, relatively recently emerged as a TKI that has activity with 315I uh, led to some degree of optimism, and I will get to that uh, shortly. Um, the guideline recommendations. So um, we have uh, the uh, European guidelines, uh, which refer to options for patients who have a T315I mutation. 
uh, being ponatinib. Um, and then if ultimately that is not an option for patients who are intolerant or do not respond, oftentimes they, uh, the, the recommendation is to type the patients and proceed with planning for allogeneic transplantation. Similarly, uh, the, the, um, the NCCN network uh, provides uh, relatively um, similar recommendations of ponatinib, but also mention omacetaxine, uh, which is an agent which we use uncommonly, but has some degree of activity in CML through a separate uh, mechanism, and also allogeneic stem cell transplant is also recommended by the NCCN for these uh, difficult and resistant patients. So that brings me to uh, the clinical trials of ponatinib, the TKI that has activity specifically in patients who have develop resistance to other TKIs, and in particular, T315I altered mutations. Um, and as can be seen here, the light blue bar graph uh, to the far right demonstrates the hematologic responses, cytogenetic responses, and perhaps most importantly, the major molecular responses of above 50 percent. And these have been updated over the years, and actually I, I believe I borrowed this from Jerry as well. Um, in patients who have T315I mutations, you have a progression-free survival and an overall survival uh, that approaches 66 percent at five years, which is remarkable for this high highly resistant uh, patient population. Now, no good deed uh, goes unpunished, and uh, ponatinib uh, has a, a box warning um, that has been uh, provided with its prescribing information, specifically uh, regarding vascular occlusion and heart and uh, vascular um, thrombotic events uh, that have been seen, um, albeit in a minority of patients. Um, but this increases over time in patients who have risk factors such as prior episodes of ischemia, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, and uh, diabetes, and especially for patients who are of older age. So this is becoming a, uh, an increasingly important area of study and investigation to sort of determine uh, what, how we can potentially ameliorate this risk for patients that need ponatinib um, after having uh, progressed through prior lines of treatment or have resistance mutations. And there are a variety of options uh, that are available to patients potentially to manage dyslipidemia, manage hypertension, uh, consider aspirin if it's uh, uh, appropriate um, to try and manage patients. But you will have, uh, on occasion, patients who have very high risk of thrombotic events for whom ponatinib may be quite risky. Omesotaxine. So omesotaxine is not a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, it's a very old agent um, that uh, inhibits a protein synthesis through its effect uh, on the ribosomal machinery. And uh, specifically in chronic phase CML, it has been studied for some time, and a uh, phase two study uh, revealed that it has activity. Now, that activity, in my humble view, is not the, uh, the most uh, ground-shaking activity. You have uh, hematologic response. Uh, in a, a sizable number of patients, which is important uh, to get some degree of disease control. However, cytogenetic and molecular response is in a very small number of patients. Um, and in fact, in the initial study, a couple of studies have been done in the initial study, only 16 percent of patients achieved a complete cytogenetic response. Additionally, uh, there are other logistical, uh, practical factors that impact the use of omesotaxine. It can cause cytopenias, um, and that can be a challenge during the course of treatment. Additionally, it's given subcutaneously uh, twice a day over a period of two weeks initially and then once a week every four weeks, um, and folks have to be either receiving that at a, uh, a hospital or an institution or be trained sufficiently to receive it elsewhere. So practically, it's also quite challenging, but may be an appropriate drug uh, for a patient that does not have uh, other suitable options. Uh, additionally, the median duration of hematologic response, at least in the initial study, was nine months. In another study, I think it approached 11 months. Um, so it's transient. So even if you do get a response, it is transient. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind for these uh, patients who develop uh, resistance. And some folks have started um, to use this drug in certain scenarios as a bridge prior to allogeneic transplantation. This brings me to Asiminib, um, uh, formerly known as ABL001, a novel allosteric ABL kinase inhibitor, potent and specific for the ABL kinase, but it has a distinct allosteric mechanism of action. Whereas uh, the traditional um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, whether it be imatinib, disatinib, basudinib, nilotinib, should mention all of them, I guess, <laughs> ponatinib, um, 
they bind the uh, sort of ATP binding pocket and interfere uh, with that. Uh, the uh, aseminib binds the mirror state binding pocket, and it keeps the BCR able kinase in an inactive conformation and has its therapeutic impact in that fashion. Uh, the initial uh, Nature paper was quite elegant in cell models. It demonstrated um, that like uh, the traditional TKIs, uh, the drug was quite active in BCR-ABLE positive uh, cell models uh, with a very low uh, IC50. And perhaps uh, more uh, intriguing, let me see if I can do the zapper pretty well. Um, here are the traditional uh, uh, mutations, resistance mutations you see when you treat patients with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors in blue. The circle is the T315I, and as you can see with imatinib, with nilotinib, with dasatinib, quite resistant still with a very high IC50, the same thing with basutinib. Panatinib, it's quite sensitive to. And the other drug here that we look at, the siminib, the ABLE001, uh, there is activity against this highly resistant uh, alteration as well, um, um, which in particular this drug uses a separate different mechanism. Uh, data from the use of asiminib in clinical trials has been presented over the course of the last few years. This is data from 2016 at ASH, which looked at uh, various patients, uh, a variety of doses and a dose escalation study um, for patients who have had demonstrated resistance uh, to prior treatment, uh, including uh, ponatinib resistance or progression, and demonstrated that a large proportion of patients uh, achieved hematologic remission, cytogenetic responses, and a, a smaller but sizable number of patients achieving molecular responses uh, by uh, 6 and 12 months. Relevant to today's discussion is the role of asiminib uh, in the case of a patient who has a T315I mutation. Um, this data, looking at a higher dose, uh, 200 uh, milligrams twice a day, was presented at last year's or this past year's uh, ASH meeting, 200 milligrams twice a day. And uh, most of the patients with these T315I mutations on study had received multiple prior tyrosine kinase inhibitors, with ponatinib being the most, most common recently used uh, TKI. I've updated this data from the presentation as opposed to the abstract. Um, but large majority of patients achieved a complete hematologic response, um, which is quite remarkable. Patients that uh, went in with a hematologi in hematologic response actually still maintained their hematologic response, which is equally important, suggesting that the drug remains quite active. Seventy-five percent of evaluable patients that achieved a complete cytogenetic response by 24 weeks, and 80 percent by 48 weeks. Um, and again, relevant to today's discussion, six of ten patients who were resistant or intolerant uh, to ponatinib also achieved complete cytogenetic responses. Now, this number is low. It's a small number uh, of patients studied, but nevertheless quite promising. As far as molecular response, meaning reduction in the levels of the BCR-ABLE transcript, 10 of 30 patients achieved a major molecular response, which is a three-log reduction by six cycles after starting treatment. Among ponatinib-naive patients, uh, 7 of 13, and among patients who are resistant or intolerant, a lower number, 3 of 17, achieved a major molecular response. Now, we always uh, are obviously happy to see uh, efficacy data. But this drug does also has some range of toxicity. So um, I would say the most frequent uh, adverse events on this study that were somewhat unique were lipase elevation, um, arthralgias, but also the uh, fatigue and nausea, uh, which were seen on study. This is just a, a di diagrammatic uh, representation of the reductions in uh, molecular levels of BCR able uh, for patients <coughs> studied. This was from the abstract uh, presentation, so it's a, s a slightly smaller number that was actually presented, but the proportion of patients who had an MMR is very similar. So this is where my, uh, you know, uh, take-home point hopefully will come across. The T315 altered patient who is intolerant to inappropriate for or refractory to ponatinib treatment, what are the options? Allogeneic stem cell transplantation, as uh, Jerry uh, went through, uh, potentially curative, and I would say curative in the majority of patients. So that's a very important point. But there is a risk of morbidity and mortality, in a minority, perhaps, in terms of mortality, but it's there. Uh, 
Some patients may not be candidates due to age or comorbidity or donor availability, you know, so um, I think that's an important consideration. Omesotaxin, it has activity in chronic phase CML and because it's not a drug that impacts the binding pocket um, of the able kinase, it has activity in the T315 alt, alt, eye altered disease. But it's non-curative, it has a transient response duration um, and has hematologic toxicity. So I would say uh, it has only modest clinical impact uh, in terms of patients, especially younger patients who have curative potential. Novel and emerging therapies, among which um, are uh, asiminib, is asiminib, uh, but there are other um, TKIs that are uh, coming along, and I'll briefly allude to them as well. Uh, a trial of a novel therapy such as asiminib uh, may make sense. Uh, these are well suited for patients that are not appropriate for transplant modalities in the current time. So I cannot recommend that a patient should go on it, uh, obviously an experimental therapeutic, but like Jerry, I do recommend the use of clinical trials to help advance uh, our current um, uh, therapeutic armamentarium. Other BCR ables of potential interest. K0706, I like because it sounds like knockout. 706, uh, knock out the disease. It's active against pcr able It's being studied um, in uh, CML. It's, I don't know much about this drug in particular, but I know it has some activity against T315i. Axitinib, it's approved for renal cell carcinoma, but also has activity against various tyrosine kinase, um, kinases, uh, including bcr able and in particular bcr able T315i, according to preclinical studies, and that is also under uh, clinical trial study. PF114 apparently uh, is in a phase one trial and uh, for patients with T315i mutations and resistance to prior TKIs and it's ongoing in Russia. Um, but apparently it's a similar uh, drug to other TKIs in terms of its structure. Clinical studies that are, uh, have been recently or are available, of course, the uh, ABLE 001 study uh, with Asiminib that is a study that has led to the promising results which I demonstrated here. Uh, the study of KO706, PF114, and also Excitinib are also listed here as potential trials that may be suitable uh, for some patients. So those are the slides I have, um, and I'm happy to discuss further.